Our Heavenly Father, we pause a moment to lift before you Mike Vines, set in, set in, uh, at the hospital today with guys all over him trying to figure out what's, what's wrong with his ticker. You encourage Mike. You be sure that Mike gives them the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's not in the hospital with some ticker. He's in, in there because his ticker is a necessary way for him to talk to nurses and doctors about Jesus Christ. Otherwise, God could have left him a home or, or, or he could have died. That's either you, you know, you're either living or dead. Make Mike, make Mike, Mike aware of it. He's not in the hospital because of his ticker. Because God has got him on a mission, an excuse to talk to people about Jesus Christ that wouldn't hear it today and need to hear it today. Boyce, I pray for Boyce. He didn't go to the hospital because he's got a bad heart. Goes to the hospital because God's got a great heart. You go to Chick-fil-A because we're hungry. We go to Chick-fil-A because God is hungry for people to, that are hungry and searching for righteousness. May we step up the plate and be responsible for our daily activities. What's going on? And who's coming in and out of our life every day that need to stop? You need to stop and cause them to pause and to reflect on Jesus Christ. I pray today, Father, that we would understand James' strong apologetics here. This is so misunderstood. It is so preached out of context. May we bring it back into the reality where everybody can get it. This is the difference between a living faith and a dead faith. Pray we would understand it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are. As I said in my introduction, you pay attention if anyone says that's an apologetics that he's arguing. In James 14, he's talking about faith. It's faith, either it's working or it's not working. It's not faith between, it's not faith versus works. It's a living faith versus a dead faith. And, of course, we've, we've done all this. So here's point number one. James is not contrasting faith and works, my people. He is contrasting the difference between a living faith and a dead faith in regards to the faith cycle. That faith cycle is dynamite. That will open up so many doors in the word of God for your life. James is one of them. People so misunderstand this. They so misunderstand it. James opens and closes the apologetics of faith argument with the doctrinal principle in the first section, verse 17, in the second section, in verse 26. You need to pay special attention to that. In this first section of the apologetics of faith, in verses 14 through 17, he says, even so, even so, he's at a conclusion to the verses to the, to the argument, verses 14, 15, 16. Even so, faith, if it has no work, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Look. And the faith cycle, you have here, you have the promise of God on one side, you have the word of God on one side, and the work of God on the other side of faith. There is a, 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 a faith side of the word, and there's a faith side of the word working. You're hearing and believing the word, and now the word is transferred into your soul into a works performance. It is the work, the working object of your faith is the word of God based on the character of God. And so the word that you get on the hearing believing side is now ready to be applied and completed on the work side of faith. The living side, not the learning side, the living side of your life. Not the learning side of your life, the living side of your life. This is where people fail. They were failing in the early church. They're still failing. I don't want you to be one of those people. I want you to be one of those people that complete the faith cycle and God shouts, friend of God. And if nobody else ever hears that in time, 
the angelic world does. The invisible world that we are at war with hears it loud and clear. We know, that, we know that from the book of Job. Now we know it from the book of James. In this section, when he talks about, well, anyhow, we just know that. The living faith that's described in the second chapter, in the second section, 18 to 26, when we, when we get to 26, he says, For just as the body without the spirit is dead. What a great illustration that is, right? And look, these adverbs, just as, so also, these are adverbs. Just as, so as, they're, they're what we call comparative adverbs. They're, and they're, they're identical they're identical in analogy. Now, if you don't understand the first part and believe it, then you got a problem with the second part because he's used a very... This, this would be like a parable. This analogy is so common sense. Who doesn't know, who doesn't know the first part of this as the body without the human spirit is dead? Right? You do know that, don't you? That when you die, the body goes to the grave, the spirit goes back to the Father, and the soul goes either to heaven or to hell. You do know that. If you don't know that, then this, you must close your book up and forget it because that's a common sense analogy. This is a, this is a funeral home idea. So that tells you that everybody has a human spirit at birth, and he doesn't have one at death, right? It goes back to the Father. His spirit goes back to the Father. The soul goes to destiny de de determination, and the body goes to the grave. Okay. If you understand that first part in common analogy, that's a, what we call a common analogy. If you understand the common analogy, then the second one will make sense to you. If you don't understand the first one, then forget the second one because you're out to, the, you know, you're out to lunch. And it's too early. You could be out to breakfast right now, but not out to lunch. So also, so also, comparative analogy, so also faith without works is dead. He's talking about a working faith. Not comparing works and faith like, like Paul does in Romans 3 or 20. Galatians 2. Now here's my second point. Understanding the following, I can't tell you how point two, if you get nothing else, get point two. I mean, you walk away and you learn the second point. Because this doctrinal formula is absolute. If you get this, you'll understand why the faith cycle is important and how it works. You will understand James 2 when he talks about faith, faith, living faith works. Here's the formula. It's in three parts. I want you to learn these three parts. You've got to learn these three parts. Look, look up here. It's just memorization. <laughs> memorization. But you've got to get it. Like you have to learn the faith cycle, you've got to learn the faith cycle formula. Here's the formula. Here's the first part. Listen to them. It's, gonna, it's a, a syllogism. Watch this. A, B, and C. Watch this. A living faith must have a trusting working object. Spiritual faith. Now, you know, I'm not talking about just faith in general. I'm talking about specific. I'm talking about a spiritual faith. Must have a trustworthy working object. Point two, that trusting working object is always the word of God. And I would add to you categorically taught. Faith must have a trusting working object. That trusting working object is always the word of God. 
And the word of God can always be trusted. Be, listen to me. Because it's based on the character of God and not on the character of man. How do I know it? Listen. Rahab the harlot in her lifetime had these words spoken to her, friend of God. Because he mentions two that had that. He mentions a Abraham and how you get it and Rahab. One a Jew and one a Gentile. One a Jew and one a Gentile. See, we could say one a woman, one a male. We could say one free, one slave. We, we, we could go out all day with that stuff, couldn't we? Because we're one in Christ. But see, you get, a, you get a special titled name. You know, when you win an Olympic gold or bronze or silver, you may, may only win one and you only may win one in a lifetime, but it's a lifetime achievement. Did you know that? I've got a cousin, cousin out of Michigan, wrestler out of Michigan that won the gold. We still talk about that. He don't. You know, people who win them don't really talk about them. It's the people who, who can't imagine them win them that talk about it all the time. When God shouts that voice, friend of God, out into the invisible world of the angelic conflict, I can't begin to tell you. If I say hi, Cotton, you know what I'm talking about? I can use it because I never heard that before. I mean, that's high Cotton. That's big-time stuff. That formula... For spiritual faith, spiritual faith must have a trustworthy working object. That trustworthy object is always the word of God. And the word of God can always be trusted because it's based on the character of God and not on the character of man. You get that in your soul and you're off to the races. You got to get that though. Because that's the formula of the faith cycle. That's the formula. That's the doctrinal formula of what makes it work. Well, God, I would trust you if you just ease up on my pressure. Oh, God, I would trust you if you just, if you could, if I could just see your hand, uh, give me a thousand dollars. Oh, God, I would. You never do that. Notice I gave you Bible verses with each one of those. The trustworthy work and object, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, right? The conviction of things not seen. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, Hebrews 11.1 1 shows you the whole work. For example, the first half is the hearing and believing side. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. That's, that's the word side. The conviction of things, not, that, that's the living side of it. That's the applying. One's learning, one's living. One's the word side, one's the work side of the word. The word working out in our life, the truth. Because, listen, Romans 4, 21, whatever God promised, he is able and willing to perform. How come you don't know Romans 4.21? How come you don't know Romans 10.15 as much as I say it? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. It, listen, this lesson is the difference in your life between a living faith and a dead faith. You all got faith. It depends whether it's living or dead. Everybody's got faith. I mean, you got faith. You've been around this church long enough to have faith. You stand here, stay here a year, I'll teach you what faith is all about. But, but is it a living faith or a dead faith? That's James' issue in his church. He's talking to his church here. 
Here's point three. Therefore, the difference between a living faith and a dead faith is the trustworthy working object. And not just the hearing side of it, not just the learning side, I hear, I understand, I believe, but it's the application and completing side that's dynamic as well. Dead faith does not have a, tr a trustworthy living object. See, the Word of God, listen to this, listen. Write, write this down. Write this down. I, I didn't write it on your paper. I don't write everything. It's Hebrews 4.12. See, the Bible is not a dead book. Once it's heard and believed, it becomes alive. Once the... Listen to me. It's a dead book if you don't read it. <laughs> it's a dead book if you don't believe it. But if you read it and believe it, it becomes alive. How do I know it? Hebrews 4.12. The, the word of God is alive, powerful, sharper than two-edged sword to the piercing and dividing of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrows, and has become a critic of the thoughts and intentions of the human heart. The word of God becomes alive when you read it and believe it, when you hear it and understand it and believe it. The word of God becomes alive and ready for living, for living, not learning, living. It is ready now to be brought out into the life of a person and brought to fulfillment and completion so that when it is done, the Father shouts to the angelic world, a friend of God. And they'll all look in the angelic world and go like, isn't that Rahab the harlot? Yes, God says. And he smiles grace over the angelic world. That's like sunshine for us. Listen, if you miss this service today in your life, your life's going to be a mess. This is what James is saying. This is James' apologetic argument to you. Here's, here's how this thing, watch this now. Here's what you got to be careful in your life. Negative volition. And listen, there's two sides to negative volition. My pastor teacher laid this out. It was one of the great, all-time great breakthroughs in my soul. He explained the difference between primary negative volition and secondary negative volition. This one you need to get too. This is like the Dr. Lee formula. Primary negative volition, look at your face cycle. See your face cycle on your paper? You see where primary negative volition is? What side is it on? The word side. Don't give me no right and left. This is just an illustration. It's on the word side. That's where primary negative, primary negative volition, you watch out because it can, listen, it'll put faith to death. Negative volition will put faith to death. If you don't come and hear the word of God, that's negative volition primary. Once you hear it and don't understand it, neg, that's primary negative volition. If you hear it and won't believe it, that's primary negative volition. It's on the learning side. It's on the word side. Look where secondary negative volition is. Now pay attention to me. Look where it is. What side is it on? On the work side of faith, isn't it? Not on the word side, on the work side. Secondary negative volition, you heard the word of God, you understood it, and you believed it, but now you won't apply it. You won't second, you, listen, you won't walk by faith, you walk by sight, right? You don't walk by faith, you walk by sight. You've killed it. You've killed faith. You walk by faith. Not, 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 not. <laughs> I don't know why I'm hollering. I have no idea. Jane thinks I ought to go have my ears tested. But she's probably right. She's probably right. It could be, maybe, because I've had a two-and-a-half-year-old and a, a five in my house for about four days who are always hollering. 
and just stay alive, I have to holler. But Jane says I do it when they're not there, so I don't know. Here's Peter. I'm going to show you primary negative volition with Peter. Now, he's a mature believer. He's a mature believer. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, 21 through 23, and Jesus sets him down and says, I got to go to, you know, I got to go to Jerusalem. Uh, they're go, they're going to arrest me. They're going to try me as a, as a criminal of the state. They're going to crucify me. I'm going to be buried on the third day. I'm going to be raised from the dead. hoo And Peter was, no way. Look, you're depressing me. You keep talking this way. You're depressing me. And I'm telling you, no way is that ever going to happen. And you're depressing me. And I think you should stop. Not only me, you're getting all the guys upset. And, he, and Jesus, that's that famous line when Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You're a stumbling block to me. What's, he, what's the stumbling block about, faith cycle? What's the stumbling block about, faith cycle? I cannot go to the cross and a dead faith. Neither can you get through tomorrow without it either. You've got to have a living, dynamic faith. That's why you come to church. That's why you hear the Word of God. That's why you believe the Word of God, because you need it. Mike Vines, you need it today in the emergency room. Boy Smith, you needed, you needed it last week when you were in the room, and they were saying you've got heart blocking. Deborah Smith, you, let's see, I'm just calling out names of people that are in the midst of it right now, and we're praying every day for them. Listen, every time we have a prayer list, and I know you've got one longer than mine, when you got one, you're praying for people who are in it, who've got to bring their faith into the dynamics of letting it work through your life. Don't shut it down, right? I mean, we do not like those midnight calls, do we? Especially when we, we, we think that that's a phone number from one of our kids or from a police station or something, right? Your heart stops. As a pastor, I hate those, those calls like that at night. When I get a 2 o'clock in the morning call, it's, it's never, I've won, I've won something. Wouldn't that be good one time? No, it's one of those one of those things that drop you to your knees and you weep and you pray and you, you cry out before God. And I pray, oh God, may that person, he's on the work side of faith. May he not shut it down. Secondary negative volition shuts it down and says, it's too painful, I'm not going to do it. And Jonah, I don't want to go preach to a bunch of heathens. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to. Stop that. Stop that, because God has got you in the most extraordinary place to have your name and have your name called out as the friend of God. You couldn't get a better prize in this world than that. When that name is called out there, you'll get a crown over there. It's a big deal. It's a lot bigger than you think it is. Well, I'll take it or leave it. Not once, not, not once it's in your hand. You won't take it or leave it. And there's Peter. Listen to this one. In Luke 22, this is one, this is what, I hate to pick on Peter, but since God did in the Bible, he's a good one. He's a good one because he worked his way out of it. That's why he's a good one. In, in Luke, the 22nd chapter, 31 through 40, listen to what Jesus says to Simon, Simon. Now, you know he's in trouble. Remember when you were a kid and whoever your custodian was over you called you by a certain name? You knew you were in trouble? When my mother said, Ronnie Leon, I was in worse trouble than you could possibly imagine. Of course, you only had to say it a few times. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan. Now we got Satan on Simon. Listen to what he says to Simon. He's told him once before. 
Just like I tell you, I tell you over and over and over the same stuff. And I, have, and, and I tell you again, it's all like brand new. How is that possible? Where have you been? That that's like, ooh. You've been on what we used to call the Tulis. You've been out in the Tulis. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission. You know what that is? That's the story of Job, isn't it? You think Satan's still not doing that on us? You're still running reconnaissance. Oh, listen, when your name gets shouted in the angelic world, friend of God, you know he's on your door. Huh? And before the Lord leaves pay Peter's life on earth, he's going to tell Peter, there's some good days coming to you. You're going to be crucified. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Here's my gift to you before I leave. You're going to be crucified. So when his day comes, history says Peter demanded that they turn him upside down so they never would miss the difference between his crucifixions and Jesus Christ because I didn't come and die for the sins of the world, but Jesus did. Crucify me upside down. I don't deserve to be in the same ballpark. Merry Christmas, Peter. And let me tell you, of all of the great ministries Peter had, listen, if he was true in that death, as God said he would, before he left this world, God said, Simon Peter, fishing extraordinaire, friend of God, friend of God, Oh, to have our name shouted in the angelic world before we live this world, Horton. <sighs> My family always asked me, what do you want to leave as a legacy that we might put on your tombstone? Friend of God. So that's important. The other thing, what you, you understand what James is talking about, the other thing that's important for you to understand today is the, is the formula. You must learn the formula of faith. There's three parts to it, and uh, try to do it like a syllogism where you move from one, point, one part of it to another part to a third part would be easy for you to remember a trustworthy you know, faith has got to have a trustworthy um, uh, object, working object. That working object is always the trustworthiness of the Word of God. And it's always trustworthy because it's based on the character of God and not on the character of man. What he, he gives you the Word on the one side, he needs to be carried, he will carry through. Romans 4, 21 says that he promises it over here and he wants you to stay with him on it until he delivers over here. He's going to give you by the word. He's going to give you the promise. And then he's going to give you the performance. It's God's word. It's God's performance. It's your faith. And so for faith to work, to have the dynamics, it's got to work on the learning side and the living side. We've tried to be. Over the years, I've studied this in my own personal life. And I found out that this is exactly how it works. It's how it works in my life. It works in other people's life. This is the way it works. So you really, and in my opinion, that's what James is talking about. This is what James is talking about. He's not talking, he's talking about either you got a living faith or a dead one. It could, it could become dead on primary negative volition or secondary negative volition. 
Now, it can be revived. You can confess your sin and be back in the program. Uh, uh, Jonah did it. He went, he, uh, Jonah, he went secondary negative volition. He heard the word. He told God, I acknowledge. He was like the, he was like the son that the father told him what he wanted him to do, what the father's will was. He said, yes, sir, I will do it, and then didn't do it. He got on a boat and sailed the wrong way like God don't know what boats are sailing. And, um, and so you know the story. And so, but listen, for to come back, you know, he goes through the, the stomach of the whale to get back. And when he comes back, God sent him down, told him the same thing he told him. He told him in the third chapter, verse 1, the very thing he told him in the first chapter. He told him the third chapter. He, okay, just because you went through, just, th just because you went through a watery grave and was brought back doesn't mean that anything has changed between me and you as far as my will. My, you haven't altered my will a bit, but hopefully you've altered yours. Trial, tribulation, and uh, rebuke should bring you back to a place that says, not my will, but thy will be done. And so we're in the third chapter with him. And you know where we are in the third chapter? Listen to me. We're, we're at primary positive volition. We're not a secondary. We're at primary. He took him right back to primary where he said, this is my will. Go do it. And he went and did it. He went from primary to positive volition to secondary positive volition. And he went with a bad attitude. And listen, isn't that interesting how God, God dealt with it? God wasn't happy with his attitude, but he was, help, he was happy with his performance. He did what he told him to do. I want you to go to preach the gospel. I want to get people saved. He went with a sorry attitude, but he preached a good gospel. It just shows you the word of God, the power of the word of God is not in the preacher. It's in the character of God in it. You know, we get all carried up with, with personalities of people, and what you really have to believe in is the Word of God. Whether, you know, most of you probably wouldn't have liked Paul as a preacher. But it's not about the personality, it's about the message. So what is this message? Because you have to live, you have to base your life on the message, not on the person. And so you, you, need, to, you need to be sure that you're getting the word of God that's being explained the best of his ability. And he, under the power of the Holy Spirit, you're able to take it into a, a, a belief system that works. It, don't we all want a faith that works? I mean, why would you pray? Listen, people don't pray that don't know that. People who know that, their prayer life is dynamic. And listen, once, they're, once they are confident that their prayers get answered, it's amazing how many people God sends to them, to, sends to you to explain that to them, don't, all right? And listen, God sends them to you not for you just to pray for them, but to teach them how to pray, for, pr pray in their life for God, right? Ah, uh, you're not paying attention. When God sends you somebody that's a believer and he says to you, would you pray for me? It would be a great opportunity for you to discuss with them a little bit about prayer. Now, it doesn't mean they don't know how to pray. They want other people to pray for them. But it could mean it would be worth a question, wouldn't it? Because it could be they come to you because they don't know how to pray. Listen, the disciples of Jesus came to Jesus and teach us to pray. Now, these people may not be able to tell you that, but I have people come to me that ask me to pray, and I think to myself, well, why do you ask me that? I don't say that, but I think that. And so I try to get around to the point of, for example, they tell me what, here's what I do. They tell me what their prayer request is, like with you, right? Would you pray for me when my marriage is in trouble or whatever? I say to them, you do know that the only way prayer is answered is you have to pray according to the will of God. Well, I don't know. Well, I, I take them to 1 John 5, 14 and 15, I read it. Because I'm thinking if they don't know that, which is a key element of getting prayer answered, right? 
1 John 5, 14 and 15. You want God to hear your prayer? You better pray according to his will or, or he will not hear you. And so I start with that. And if they're fuzzy or they don't know that that works, then I go, are you aware that you have to pray in the power of the Holy Spirit that he intercedes for us on behalf, right? So I take him to Romans 8, 26, 27. Because listen, if you don't know how to pray in the Holy Spirit, it's not going to work either. You can have a conversation with God. God will listen to conversations, but if you want prayer answer, you've got to pray according to his will in the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, you can talk to God about anything, but if you want your prayers answered, where you go like, God answered my prayer. You know, it's like all these Christmas stories. Send a letter to Santa Claus, and when they got, get it, they go, oh, oh, for oh, Santa Claus, give me a Santa Claus, Santa Claus, Santa Claus, yeah. The truth of the matter is, when people know that this is the, I can pray according to the will of God, and they get it, then they go like, oh, yeah, God. But you know how to do it. So what I do when people come to me, I'm going to pray for their prayer, but this is the, I'm not a fast food pastor. It is, so when they, you know, you're going to stop off and give me prayer, you know, I don't have a drive through but I do have a ministry responsibility, so I just start with basic things to ask them. If they don't know those three things are, which are key to prayer, would you agree with that? That who, who should tell them that? The one they came to to say, would you pray for me? Because I'm going to say to them, well, listen, I have a prayer request for you. Would you pray for me? And say that when I leave them, I'm going to give them a prayer request. But I am not going to give them one of my prayer requests unless I know. So I'm going to ask them one of three basic questions. If they don't answer, I'm just going to go to the next one and the next one. And then if they get that, for me, they start writing it on a napkin or something. They don't write it down. They don't know it. Don't write it down. I'm not going to give them a prayer request because they're never going to leave the restaurant. They're not going to get to heaven. It's going to stay in Chick-fil-A. And I'm just saying. I'm just talking about me, how, what I do. I just don't think God sends people into my life that I don't have a ministry to. And if I can teach a person how to fish rather than keep giving them fish, we're both better off, are we not? I don't, don't tell me you don't like fish, and it was a bad illustration. Now, here's my final point, and we're going to go home. I shouldn't say that because that's a kiss of death, ain't it? That sure is the kiss of death. In James 2, 18 through 26, our lesson, he gives another example from the sphere of angelic conflict in verses 19 and 20 when he says this. He showed a dead faith within monotheistic Judaism. He contrasted monotheistic Judaism to the demonic world. I don't think I've ever done that in all the years I've been in ministry, Al, where somebody came in and he said, I got a problem, and I compared him to the demonic world. I mean, even if it ran through my mind, I don't think I'd go there. I'd go, ah, no, that's a little way out there. James did it. Listen to what James did. In verses 19 and 20, James says, you believe that God is one, you do well. In other words, here's what he's saying. That's a start, not a finishing place. That's what he said. That's a start, not a finishing place. Remember, here's what his subject is. Here's what he said. The demons also believe and shudder. They're terrified. They believe in one God and are terrified of it. <laughs> I told a guy this one day. He said, I'm an atheist. My sister said, I ought to come in and talk to you. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm an atheist. And 
and I took him to this passage. I said, well, you know what? You're really unique. Because in the angelic world, there are none. You're a, you're a rare breed of guy. Because in the angelic world, there are no atheists. Not even the demons. They all believe in God. <laughs> there are no atheists among the angelic, whether elect or fallen. None. None. <laughs> and when you read the story of the life of Christ, and he kept meaning demon-possessed people, the demons would tell him that. They were terrified. James goes on to say, are you willing to recognize you foolish person? King James calls them vain. Right? Vain fellow. It's kainos anthropos. Listen. Are you willing to recognize you foolish person? That's Psalms 14.1. You know what that is? Huh? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's what James is. That's just exactly what James has done here. He's quoted, what James has just done is quoted Psalms 14.1. When he called him a vain person, a foolish person. That's exactly what, he's quoting that verse. He says, but are you willing to recognize, O oh foolish person, that faith without dead is useless? See, he, he, he's back to that word, useless. You went to church, you learned the word of God, you've heard the word of God, you believe the word of God, and you won't apply it into your personal part of your life. In your very personal part of your life, you won't apply it. You have a dead faith. And therefore, your faith you learn in class is now useless. You know how many people go to church, even in this church, and walk away with a useless faith? Faith. They've heard it. They've understood it. And maybe even believed it won't put it personally into that. Personal. Personally put it into the light. See, it's the personal. See, this is impersonal in your life. I'll tell you when it gets personal, when God knocks on your door with an issue in your life, and it makes it personal, doesn't he? Mike Bynes, Mike Bynes didn't, never thought about going to bed that night and being in an emergency room when he woke up. I mean, who wouldn't plan that out, would he? Well, let's see. I think since it's Christmas is coming, I think, well, here's what I'll do. I'll go to bed tonight, create a heart attack, and uh, go to mercy. That would be a good thing, yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, who does that? God has your life planned out. You don't. And that's a good way to live. Live by faith. And what kind of program beats faith? <laughs> what kind of program could you come up with that would be better than faith? I don't know. <laughs> Just asking. The demonic world believes in one God without any personal benefit in time and eternity. You know these demons, these fallen angels that believe in one God? Every time his name comes up or the name of Jesus Christ or the power of the Holy Spirit, they shudder and are in terror. Do you know why? Because they have no hope. Listen, they came from another time and another world into this time capsule of our world and have no promise of tomorrow. Because their tomorrow, when their life situation is done, they're going to the lake of fire. Matthew 25, 41, and they know it. We're the fools. You leave this world without Christ, you go to the next world, it will be hell. When they left their world and came to this one, it was hell. You understand? 
That's where they're headed. The lake of fire. Revelation, the 20th chapter. So when, when, listen, when they hear God, they know the reality that he is. And listen, they have no hope. Therefore, they're filled with terror. Terror is lights all above fear. Terror is so far above fear that you can't even describe fear to a person that's in terror. They, their mind, a person that is terrified, can't begin to comprehend fear of phobia. They are so far out of being able to bring their mind and composition to some place of sense. And every time they would, they would come in, the, they, the, demon, the fallen angels believe in God and are terrified of it. And they live in our time zone. They live in our time zone. This is the post-Diluvian world. And they're headed for hell. But when they left their domain, that's where they're headed. When you leave yours, if you don't have faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins and not his, was buried and raised out from the dead on the third day, when you leave this time zone, when you leave this period, that's where you're headed. Revelation, the 20th chapter, you need to read them both. Read your place in it. Read their place in it. You don't want to be there. They're, all of them are going to the same place. I don't care. I don't believe in it. It doesn't matter to me. Doesn't matter to me whether you believe or don't believe it. The demons believe it because they know it's true. When you leave this time zone, by that I mean this post diluvian period of life, if you don't have Christ, that's where you're going. You're going with the rest of them. It's not to intend to make you comfortable, it's intended to make you uncomfortable. So you want to read these things. I left a lot of passages of scriptures, especially you want to read Luke 4, 31 to 37. It's well worth your read. Do you know why a spiritually advancing believer does not tremble? Listen to me. <laughs> Listen to me now. Do you know why a spiritually advancing believer, church age believer, why he does not tremble in fear and conviction when he hears the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? You know why? Let me tell you. I used to live in a time when I heard it and I trembled in fear. Not anymore. I, I, listen, I rejoice when I hear the gospel of Jesus Christ preached. I am joyful. But there was, before I got saved, I did not want to hear the gospel. I didn't even, I didn't even want to hear a gunshot. Because I, I blew, I, even though I refused to speak it with my, my mouth, my brain believed that if I died without Christ, I'd go to hell. And listen, that's why I got saved. That's why I got saved. Now, I don't know why you got saved. And you don't have to get saved the way, way I got saved, except by the, by the message and the mechanics. You got to believe that Christ died for your sins and buried and raised from the dead, and you got to believe it to be saved. I'm just telling you how I got it. I was probably part of the demonic world, I guess. <laughs> I came to a point. Why would I be a fool and not to believe it? And I'm so happy today I did. I don't, know. I don't care what brings you to the cross. I don't care if it's love or fear like me. I don't care what brings you to the cross. Is that it brings you to the cross and then you believe it and you're, the, the cross of Jesus Christ changes your life. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a life-changing deal. That's why the devil has shut down the schools on us, and we are, we are silly not to pray them open. We are silly not to pray them open. We ought to be on our face before God every day for him to open up 
the public arena and we have the courage to go in it and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful for Horton. Still goes out there where people say you can't do and does what they say you can't do and is willing to take the hits for doing it. And we as a church ought to sponsor that guy financially to keep him running and we ought to pray every day for Horton as well as Rick when he heads out to Uganda and our missionaries on the front field, the Morgans, the Williams, the Sextons. Who am I missing? We got four guys on the mission field. Who am I missing? That's Williams. Oh, Molinars in Africa, South Africa, the Molinars. Are these people on the front line. Horton's on the front line in America. Rick's about to go on and hit the front line. And listen, we've got Ernie, we got Al, we got Tony, we got tons of people on the front line. We need to, listen, you need to pray every day for St. Clair County for the school system to open to Horton. We need to be all over St. Clair County, high schools and grammar school, or uh, junior high. Well, I call them junior high, I don't know, middle school or something. What is it, Terry, middle school? We need to be all over them. Listen, God changes hearts. The gospel goes in. He changes hearts of kids. Rebellious kids' lives are changed, right, Horton? Mine was. Horton was 10 times the child of hell than I was. <laughs> I knew him. <laughs> Didn't know him when he was 10 times the child of hell. But I, I know people that knew him when he was 10 times the child of hell. Well, let's pray. Father, we're so thankful today for these people who've come our way and studied with us. The gospel is a life-changing thing. But then, Father, it's about the Word of God. Faith is a life-changing thing. Hearing it, believing it, applying it. it. It's just, it's wonderful to see you daily in our lives just fulfilling the promises of your Word of God in our life. You sell this building, Father, and put us in another one. Put us out there, Father, with people that will fill up the pews because they're hungry for the Word of God. Send Rick, Father, and do the impossible. Send him to Uganda. May Uganda never, ever be the same. Send all who have ears to hear. May they become oriented to the grace gospel, how God is dynamic in the lives of people, and they'll take them through suffering and death and beyond. Oh, Father. We need to get, get out of the bleachers and into the game. I pray for that. I pray, Father, begin to prepare the field of, for service of Moody and, and Sinclair County. I pray for that. I pray you would open doors even now. Continue to open them up and may we be go, bold to go through them. For Jesus Christ's sake, in his name we pray, amen.